and welcome to episode 72 of Toke Signals TV, where we bring you the biggest in cannabis and hemp news stories every week. I'm Steve Elliott, the editor at ToqueSignals.com, and I'll be guiding you through the news. First of all, let's look at our Toke Signals Bud Pick of the Week, where we have some Jack the Ripper, a very fine looking sativa, which I found for $11 a gram at Hope Alternative Medicine in Silverdale, Washington. Let's do the news now, shall we? In the United States this week, an interesting new survey about public perceptions of cannabis. Safer than milk? More Americans want to ban raw milk than marijuana. Public perceptions of marijuana have certainly shifted. According to a recent study, more Americans now favor banning unpasteurized milk than favor banning marijuana. About 59% of Americans support a ban on the sale of raw, unpasteurized milk, while just 47% support a ban on the sale of marijuana. That's according to an Oklahoma State University food demand survey. A patchwork of different laws regulate raw milk in the United States, much like marijuana. States like New York and Iowa ban the retail sale of raw milk, while California and Idaho allow it. 23 states in the District of Columbia have to a greater or lesser degree legalized the medicinal use of cannabis. Four, Colorado, Washington, Oregon, and Alaska have legalized recreational use. According to the normal, 18 states have removed criminal penalties for marijuana, known as decriminalization, which is reducing simple possession roughly to the equivalent of a parking ticket. Also in the United States this week, a corporation filed its second patent application for a CBD ibuprofen pain combo. Stevia Corporation, an international farm management company and healthcare company, has announced the filing of a second important provisional patent application with the United States Patent and Trademark Office for pain treatment using a combination of ibuprofen and cannabidiol, or CBD. This provisional patent application closely follows the company's previously announced first provisional patent application for pain management using acetaminophen and CBD. Acetaminophen, of course, being the active ingredient in Tylenol. As in the previous application, this patent includes multiple claims, including, but not limited to, combinations of cannabinoids, including CBD and ibuprofen, for the treatment of pain. This provisional patent application is a legal document which establishes an early priority date for the benefit of claiming first-to-file status against other companies or individuals, and it was filed with the assistance of an intellectual property attorney, according to a prepared statement from Stevia Corporation. CBD, of course, is a cannabinoid present in most varieties of the cannabis sativa and cannabis indica plants. Unlike THC and some of the other molecules found in cannabis, CBD is non-psychoactive. And CBD is also extremely well tolerated at high doses with little or no side effects. It's essentially non-toxic. It catapulted to national prominence after being an important part of Dr. Sanjay Gupta's 2013 CNN documentary, Weed. This is our second key provisional patent application related to pain, which is one of the largest healthcare markets in the world, said George Blankenbaker of Stevia Corporation. In the past two weeks, he said, we have announced our intention to secure patents and to launch products that contain specific cannabinoids in combination with either ibuprofen or acetaminophen. Ibuprofen and acetaminophen are two of the largest selling over-the-counter drugs in the world and are the key ingredients behind Motrin and Tylenol. As the market for both prescription and non-prescription pain reliever products continues to grow, unfortunately, the amount of people experiencing side effects and the amount of people addicted to prescription painkillers also continues to grow, Blankenbaker said. Our goal is to develop a painkiller that first and foremost works. Second, it must minimize adverse side effects. Finally, it must reduce the chance of addiction. We believe we will be able to develop these three attributes in a painkiller. And as we stated in the previous announcement, we are exploring the possibility of partnering with a large pharmaceutical company that has extensive experience in the pain care market, and particularly experience with products that contain these two over-the-counter medicines, Blankenbaker said. In Colorado this week, lots of attention for a story where marijuana-based sex spray is hitting the shops. 
a new marijuana-based spray which claims to help women have better sex is hitting the shelves in Colorado this week. Foria, containing cannabis extract, claims the relaxing properties of weed will help women have better and more satisfying sex. The spray has been available for a few months in California, but only to people with a medical marijuana authorization. The Colorado rollout will be to the general public, since adults 21 and over are allowed to buy and use cannabis in the Rocky Mountain State. The edible coconut oil-based spray is designed to be sprayed onto the vagina about 30 minutes before sex. It's making its Colorado debut on Thursday at an Aspen marijuana boutique. Boria originates from Aphrodite Group, a California medical marijuana collective. It's the latest in a growing line of cannabis-infused products, including lotions, candies, and patches. The long history of marijuana use gives significant credibility to the concept, according to scientists. Cannabis is an aphrodisiac, said Jennifer Murray, CEO of CanLabs, a leading marijuana testing company. And there's a lot of nerves down there. Foria's slick marketing campaign is setting it apart from its competitors. The company is launching Foria at the X Games in Aspen, which began January 22nd. A video on the Foria website features women speaking about how they use it and its effects. Foria claims to be the very first sexual lubricant specifically designed to improve the sexual experience for women. We definitely have some patients coming in for it, requesting it specifically, said Matthew Rosen of the Kana Sutra Collective in Studio City, California. A-list celebrities that come in specifically for it, he said. You'd be surprised who comes in for it. Most people have been giving positive feedback on it, Rosen said, including his own girlfriend. We tried it together and she loved it. Foria costs about $44 for a 10 milliliter bottle in California dispensaries. Each spritz contains about two milligrams of THC, the main component of marijuana which gets you high. But Foria's makers say their blend generates heightened sensation, but doesn't produce a high. Many recreational marijuana stores in Colorado carry cannabis-infused lotions, including the legalized lotion line from Apothecana. Users say the lotions can ease pain and relax muscles. Murray said she had tried out several different kinds of topicals, including for you. If this can help women have orgasms, I'm all about that, she said. Did it work for her? No comment, Murray said with a laugh. In Washington this week, I-1372 is gathering signatures to protect and strengthen medical marijuana. Backers of this new initiative to strengthen Washington State's medical marijuana law are now gathering signatures. Initiative measure number 1372 filed January 6, 2015 will protect and strengthen the medical cannabis law by offering compassion, clarity, and consistency, according to Kurt Ludden of Cannabis Patient Protection Washington. I-1372 would bring Washington state law into compliance with stated federal policy, according to Ludden. It would allow business owners to obtain licenses for producing, processing, or dispensing cannabis in a commercial manner. It would create and empower Cannabis for Medical Use Board, made up of state and community, to govern all aspects of the market. It would maintain small private residential gardens and patient co-ops that do not violate the spirit or intent of the law as well as protecting existing cannabis farmers markets, that's crucial, serving qualifying patients. It would restore reciprocity for non-residents and other protections passed by the legislature in SB 5073. It would remove any instances of partially vetoed language. It would add post-traumatic stress and traumatic brain injury to the list of qualifying conditions. It would extend the same criminal and civil protections to qualifying patients that prescription drug patients receive. It would limit housing discrimination against medical marijuana patients. It would restrict employment-related cannabis testing for qualifying patients. It would require video proof of impairment for qualifying patients. And it would add in protection to qualifying patients under 18 years of age, patients, legal guardians, and their designated providers. There are probably many qualifying patients who are registered to vote who don't currently. Signatures are being gathered to qualify for the November 2015 ballot, according to Ludden. The deadline for gathering 246,372 signatures from registered voters to qualify is July the 2nd. In Kansas this week, medical marijuana bills were introduced and the Senate hears from supporters and opponents. State Senator David Haley 
a Democrat from Kansas City, and State Representative Gail Finney, a Democrat from Wichita, have once again introduced medical marijuana bills in the Kansas legislature, as they've done every year since 2009. None of the measures has ever gone beyond informational hearings in which no action can be taken. But Senator Haley thinks that might change this year. I think the ice is beginning to thaw regarding the reasonableness of the issue among the leadership of the legislature, according to Haley. Representative Finney, who has undergone chemotherapy for lupus, thinks the bill will at least get a hearing after being ignored by Republican legislators for years. Passing, I don't know about that, she added. Representative Dan Hawkins, a Republican from Wichita, chairman of the House Health and Human Services Committee, said he's waiting to see what the Senate does with medical marijuana. Nobody's come and really pushed it, Hawkins claimed, adding that he's heard very little from constituents about it. If you'd like to change that, there's a link you can click in the Hemp News story to let Representative Hawkins hear from the people he's supposed to be representing. Meanwhile, House Speaker Ray Merritt, a Republican from Stillwell, says he has bigger things to worry about than medical marijuana patients. I've got a lot of other things on my radar screen that are a lot more important, Stillwell said, or rather Merrick said, to contact Representative Merrick's office. You can email him at an address provided in the Hemp News story. We also have his home and office telephone numbers and his home address. Both Senate Bill 9 and House Bill 2011 would create compassion centers where authorized patients could legally obtain medical marijuana. Informational hearings were held Wednesday and Thursday in the Senate's Public Health and Welfare Committee to hear from both supporters and opponents. Interestingly, at the first informational hearing in 2010, most of the Republicans on the committee claimed they, quote, had other commitments, and they got up and left before testimony even began, Representative Gail Finney said. During the next hearing in 2012, the Republican committee chairwoman walked in with security guards with the perception there would be a bunch of druggies, according to Finney. To assume that it's only for the shoddiest people and strictly for a recreational front, that's absolutely ludicrous, Finney said. About 50 supporters attended a medical marijuana rally last Thursday at the State House. The gathering was sponsored by Haley, Finney, and groups advocating for their bills. Public opinion is shifting away from baseless charges that marijuana is bad for you, according to John Hawkswell, a retired physician from Hayes, Kansas. All over the country, we are seeing a gradual acknowledgement of the benefits of rational approaches, Hawkswell said. He also said that with Kansas's budget problems, medical marijuana could be a significant source of tax revenue. That wouldn't eliminate the budget problem, but it certainly would not make a bit of a dent in it, he said. We have to get this done, Senator Haley said. Everyone at the Capitol knows that one day, one day, medical marijuana will be available in every one of the 50 states. We know that, Haley said. The question is, will Kansas be the 24th state or the 50th? In Indiana this week, two medical marijuana bills were filed in the legislature there. Two Democratic lawmakers have filed bills that would allow the use of medical marijuana in Indiana, but neither measure is likely to make any progress in the Republican-controlled legislature, according to observers. Senator Karen Tallian, a Democrat from Portage, and Representative Sue Arrington, a Democrat from Muncie, Indiana, are sponsoring bills in the Indiana Senate and House, respectively, that would allow state residents to use cannabis for medicinal purposes with a doctor's authorization. Arrington's House bill would allow patients with conditions including cancer, glaucoma, AIDS, hepatitis C, Crohn's disease, or Alzheimer's disease to use marijuana for treatment. Unfortunately, the bill has been assigned to the House Rules and Legislative Procedures Committee, the Committee of Death, where it's unlikely to get a hearing, according to Arrington. Bills that go there usually don't come back out, Arrington told the Star Press. I would like it to at least get a hearing so people could come and tell their stories patients and physicians and others. According to Arrington, she's heard from constituents who are suffering from chronic pain and seizures who would like to use medical marijuana to ease their suffering. Tallian's Senate bill would create a new state department to oversee the medical marijuana program. Two bills she wrote over the past two years died without a hearing in the Indiana Senate. Neither bill will likely go anywhere in the GOP controlled legislature, according to Joe Losco, a Ball State University political science professor. It's certainly not a part of the Republican agenda this season, and I think Republicans would see it as taking away from the consensus of their caucus, he said.
in Washington State, back to Washington this week, where a new marijuana strain has been named after the Seattle Seahawks running back Marshawn Lynch. Talk about a Super Bowl, man. Seattle Seahawks running back Marshawn Lynch has a potent new marijuana strain named after him in the Emerald City for the second year in a row. Nate Diggity Johnson, co-owner of marijuana delivery service Green Umbrella, developed Beast Mode OG, a strain named after the football star during the run-up to last year's Super Bowl. Now Johnson and an unnamed grower have released Beast Mode 2.0, also known as Beast Mode Blue Fire, just in time for this year's big game. According to Diggity, this beast mode is even crazier than last year's. We're back in the Super Bowl and better than ever now, so it only makes sense to have a better strain, Johnson said. Careful, though, you might get weed tackled. There's no way that you're going, that you're getting by smoking this without feeling it. Kind of how Marshawn literally pushes the defense down instead of them pushing him down, Johnson enthused. It's going to push you. You're going to feel it right away. It's a super pain reliever, Johnson told TMZ, and it hits you like Marshawn hard and fast. Just to clarify, I am medical only. Johnson posted on Facebook Tuesday. This strain is not available recreationally until July. Johnson said he was nervous about naming last year's Beast Mode strain after the Mercurial Seahawks star, but he isn't anymore because some of Marshawn's people reached out to him following the release of the original Beast Mode OG. All I can say is they were not mad at me whatsoever, Johnson said. I was a little bit worried last year that maybe his management and him would be mad or not approved, but that was not the case. They are not mad at all. They gave me the okay. They were cool, Johnson said. Before we go this week, we have a must read on tokesignals.com that you'll definitely want to check out if you're keeping up with the rapidly developing world situation surrounding marijuana and specifically its medicinal applications. Brazil legalizes CBD and activists vow to continue the fight for full access to medical marijuana. It's an excellent report filed for us from our correspondent in Brazil, Sergio Vidal. He's done a great job for us there, and if you want to step on the latest in South America, that's the place to go, tokesignals.com. Hope to see you again next week. Until then, stay lifted.